Welcome, Whiskey Theologians. This is Around the Word in Many Glasses. Today, we'll be drinking Weller Special Reserve. We'll be talking about Psalm 122. Sit back, relax, pour yourself a drink, and let's get into it. First of all, today I have something that's a little bit special, especially depending on where you live. It is a Weller Special Reserve. This is put out by the Buffalo Trace Distillery, which seems to put a, just about everything out. They put out a lot of whiskey. Another one of the big popular ones is, of course, <laughs> Buffalo Trace, um, which has become increasingly hard to find where I am. I used to know of a couple of liquor stores that had it. I'm down to one hole-in-the-wall liquor store that I've seen it in. Um, that I've also seen the Weller in as well, though I've seen a little bit more of the Weller than I have of the Buffalo Trace. Um, I don't know if that's strange or not. Um, but around me, Weller is available. Price is starting to climb. So this, I've concluded that this might be one of my last bottles of Weller, at least for a while. Because while I like it, as you can see, I have had a little bit of this one already. And while I like it, I'm not willing to pray, willing to pay a premium for it. Um, that being said, let's. Get a pour and get into it because it, as I said, it is it's a good whiskey, especially if you can find it for a good price. Although I know that there are plenty of people out there who just can't find it, period. Um, and quite frankly, a lot of people out there, what I say is a price going up, I know is a very good price for something going up. Everything is relative. Um, so let's get into it. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's it's a weeded bourbon, so it's a little bit different. Now, I'll be honest, I don't know exactly what wheat does to a bourbon as far as the palate goes. But what, what I get when I taste this is kind of um, like a grainy sweetness, which I've come to associate with whiskeys with corn in it. I don't know if this has corn in it. I don't know the mash bill, other than that there is wheat in this, although there has to be some amount of corn Pretty sure for it to be a bourbon. I think it has to be over 51% corn. So that's probably what that is, if I'm right about that. Although that statistic did just come into my head. So who knows? I'm not a professional in this area. And then followed by, I tasted it right before, and what I thought was, or what I, um, I tasted this right before I started filming. The way I had initially described it was kind of like a thin or a light caramel. Back of the bottle says caramel and honey. I think that's what it is. I think that's what they're picking up on as honey, uh, is what I kind of self-described as kind of a light caramel. It's not the real heavy, deep caramel notes that you really get out of, you know, some of the, the heavier bourbons, but there's definitely some caramel in there, and I think, yeah, it's, uh, it's honey. It's a little bit sweeter, but no matter what, it's a fine bourbon, especially if you can find it, and especially if you can find it at a good price. So, we're getting back into the Psalms. It's been a while since we have uh, covered one of the Psalms, and so I'm excited today to get back into the Psalms of Ascent with uh, Psalm 122 for us today. This is, this is one that comes quickly to my mind, um, particularly the opening line, which we're gonna read, I will read here in just a moment. Um, in fact, Let's go straight into that and read through the psalm and then got a couple thoughts that we can share. So Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as is decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Their thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. So, starting out just with that opening line, um, which is, of course, I was glad when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. 
this is part of the Lutheran liturgy, and it is almost impossible for me just to straight read that um, text without getting the psalm tone in my head. And I can guarantee you that psalm tone with that just that one line over and over and over again will be in my head for at least a week or two. Um, for me, uh, for whatever reason, that's just an earworm for me. So this is this is one of the psalms that I do think about a lot because it gets stuck in my head, which on a completely other note is what the liturgy is intended to do is help things to stick into uh, your mind. So the liturgy is doing what it's supposed to be doing there, right? The fact that we put music in the liturgy is doing what it is supposed to accomplish. And that's a good thing. But I was glad when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. I think taken alone versus the, the joy of worship that we should all experience. And we don't always experience that joy. And we all, pastors included, have those times where we wake up on Sunday morning and we are not glad when uh, the alarm clock or the calendar says to us, it's time to get up, get out of bed so that you can go to the house of the Lord. But there is that joy in worship where you receive the gifts God has to give and you're able to have a opportunity to, at least most of the time, <laughs> gather with the faithful to sing those response of everything that God has given us. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's a great opening line. But I think we miss a broader picture when we just take that verse in, in itself. Um, you know, I was glad when they said to me, let's go up to the house of the Lord. Because after that, the psalm, at least to my mind, at least initially, took kind of a turn into left field. It was strange. Um, all of a sudden, now he now the psalmist is talking about Jerusalem and talking about the tribes all going to Jerusalem. So what's going on there? But I think this is really the key to understanding the psalm. And I think we can actually take um, how Jesus interprets worship in general. He doesn't uh, hold this specifically. Um, but when he teaches about forgiveness and reconciliation, where he says, don't go and offer your sacrifice. If you remember you have um, a strife or struggle with your brother, put your sacrifice down, go reconcile with your brother, and then go and worship with the Lord. And I think a similar thing is going on here. Um, the psalmist is glad when someone else says to him, let's go to the house of the Lord. The psalmist is rejoicing in the reconciliation with someone who may or may not have been at odds with him. And I think that's a more deeply what's going on with this psalm. And I think it really comes into fruition in um, the next two stanzas, if you will. The first is discussing uh, Jerusalem as a city on uh, that is bound, bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up. And there's all this conversation about the tribes going up to Jerusalem. And then in verse 6, the second stanza uh, begins with two verses on peace. Let Jerusalem be a city not of strife, but a city of peace. And I think these three stanzas are connected, obviously, they're in the same psalm. But I think they're really pushing towards this idea that Jerusalem, and particularly the Day of Atonement, which again is when these were being used, is to be a place and a time of reconciliation. Because if you know biblical history, you'll know that the tribes did not always get along. Even on a grand scale, the tribes fought with each other. Kind of like families tend to do, right? They would bicker and they would fight. Um, and I think the psalmist is saying on a big scale, you know, I was glad when these tribes all come together. When the family of God comes under one roof and and it says, let, let bygones be bygones. Uh, reconciliation is had. Forgiveness flows uh, forth. And the people of God don't have strife, but rather within the walls of Jerusalem, for the sake of your brothers even, everyone says, peace. Let's let all the animosity, all the strife, all the struggle go so that we can be at peace. Because that is what Jerusalem, that is what the tribes, that's what the people of God are intended to be. They're supposed to be at peace. Now, they're not, because we live in a sinful and fallen world. But we get a picture 
in this going up to Jerusalem. We get a picture in this going up to the house of the Lord of that peace, that peace between brothers, that peace between tribes, that peace between mankind that will come one day. We can also take this on a small scale, right? Uh, more on the level that Jesus is dealing with. If you and one other person are, you know, right, have a, a strife, uh, have a conflict, go solve the conflict and then come to the house of the Lord, right? Come into God's presence because he is the one who really does the reconciling. Um, they can start with you and someone else, but it is because of and for the sake of really Christ that reconciliation happens. Again, I'd like to really push this point home, and this will probably be a short video because I'm coming close to the end of what I wanted to cover here. Um, with the last two verses, for my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. And so kind of two, two directions, I guess two sides of the same coin, um, but different routes to get there that I want to take with this. The first is, as I alluded to already, reconciliation is only possible when God is involved. Uh, we see this uh, kind of strange thing happening with some of David's, uh, I, I believe it's in the Psalms, but certainly some of David's repentance, where he does this great evil, and then he turns to God and says, God against you and you only have I sinned. I'm, if, again, it, I didn't look any of this up, but if my memory serves me, he that is David's confession after sleeping with Bathsheba, I mean, effectively raping her, um, using guile to then get have Uriah murdered and covering the whole thing up. I, David has wronged a lot of people. I mean, Bathsheba and Uriah, certainly, but his family as well. He's married, after all. Uh, he's also sinned against himself and done this wicked thing. He's sinned against the nation. Uriah was certainly not the only one to die when um, the assault was made uh, that David ordered for the purpose of killing Uriah. And though uh, presumably a lot of those men had families. And so David is harmed in a very real way. An enormous number of people. And then he turns to God and says, against you, God, and you only have I sinned. That's strange, <laughs> because there's no two ways about it. David has wronged other people. He has sinned against other people as well. But what I think David is getting at here, and what I think is kind of a theological truth that we can glean from this, is that everyone else we sin against is another sinner. And a poor way of putting it is sinners deserve to be sinned against. Right? It's less wrong because they're not righteous people. Um, still wrong. Again, that was a, not a good way of putting it, but this channel's not about me fully flushing out ideas before I get on here. Right, This is where I do some of that. Um, and so there, there's a different scale between sinning against a righteous person, sinning against someone who's holy and perfect, and sinning against someone who's a sinner themselves. It sounds strange, and there's definitely more going on here theologically, but this also kind of fits in our um, in our just general mindset, right? Someone who does something wrong, steal, right? Steals candy from a baby versus steals candy or money from a bank, right? You know, those bankers are all wicked and evil and this baby's done nothing wrong. And even though you're stealing so much more from the bankers, you know, it's not quite as painful, it's not quite as egregious as stealing from a child. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I'm the son of a banker, so I don't think bankers are evil. And to be quite honest, babies are dirty, rotten sinners too. So <laughs> take the example for what it's worth uh, and for what it's trying to get across. But I think that's some of what's going on here, is that David, who is the author of the psalm as well, kind of says, because... God is the true offended party here. In all the times that you have sinned against me, I'm going to let it go. Because I don't have a right to hold that against you. Because I am a sinner. I've probably sinned against you. If I haven't, I've sinned against other people. 
So it's not for my sake that I am... I, I'm not angry because you've wronged me. Uh, it's because God has chosen to forgive you. And if God can forgive you, who am I to hold that sin against you? I think that's what's, I think that's a big part of what's going on here. Furthermore, and how we've decided to deal with a lot of these psalms, particularly the psalms of ascent, this is all the psalms I've been working on, except for one, um, is we put the psalm in the, in the mouth of Christ. And again, I know we've done this with uh, a lot of these psalms, but take the, take the passion. Keep the passion of Christ in mind through these final verses. verses. Uh, have Christ be the speaker when he says, For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, Peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Sounds a lot like, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Sounds a lot like Christ dying so that these sinners who are actively sinning against him, who was perfect and righteous, is choosing peace rather than destruction. Because we don't tend to think this way, but just as easily on that Good Friday, Christ could have called down a legion of angels had and completely wiped humanity from the face of the earth. It's been done with us. Done with us all. But he didn't. Instead, he is the one who dies. He dies on our behalf. For our sake, for the sake of his fellow man, he says, peace be to you. Peace be within the temple of our Lord. Uh, right? Come to Jerusalem where Christ was crucified. And there you will find peace. There you will find reconciliation. Reconciliation with your brothers, but also reconciliation with your God. And so I think that's the deeper, broader meaning of this, uh, of this psalm. I think it's a really neat psalm, actually. Um, definitely more interesting than I had thought that it would have been uh, when I first was getting ready to when I was first prepping this psalm to make this video. Because although I don't completely flesh out my ideas, I do a little bit of prep. Not a ton. Usually it's just listening to the psalm and thinking about it as I'm walking around. There's still some prep. But I think that's kind of the, the deeper, fuller meaning. This is a psalm of reconciliation. A psalm of forgiveness for the sake of and because of Christ. And so... All you who wait on the Lord, wait for that great day of reconciliation. Let us lift a glass and drink to Christ's